So, um, so nice to see so many uh, beautiful people in our room. So thank you for coming. It's so uh, great to be here. Uh, welcome to Architects Not Architecture. Um, it is difficult to put into words uh, how happy we are to be in Australia with our event format, with an in-person event for the first time. My name is Fermin Tribaldos. That should not happen. <laughs> but they will, they will fix it. Uh, my name is Fermin Tribaldos, and together with my partner, Irina Seipoku, we started this event series um, in Hamburg, in Germany, uh, back in 2015. We have held, we have held uh, 35 physical events uh, in seven countries in Europe, and uh, that's until the pandemic. And since 2020, we have held uh, more than 20 online events. This event today is not only the comeback of our physical events, finally, but also um, the first architectural architecture event ever held outside Europe. So we are very happy to be here. It is a, it is a huge honor and a privilege for us uh, to be here in Sydney with uh, two very distinguished speakers. So thank you, Angelo and Richard, for participating. And so many interesting people in this room and joining the live stream. So first of all, thank you all for participating and joining us on this special day. And we see, we see every registration and we know that there are lots of interesting people in this room. So we want to, we are going to ask you for something. In order to get to know each other a little bit better, if you could look around and introduce yourself to the, to the person in front and behind of you, and I'm not joking, can you please introduce yourself to the person in, <laughs> behind and in front of you, not, not right or left, <laughs> behind and in front. Okay, I think, okay, 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 Shh. Okay, thank you, thank you. We, it's, <coughs> okay, we see, um, we see that it's fun, and for that it's great that we have time afterwards, uh, after the talks, during the get together. So, how many of you have ever attended or watched an architecture, Architects Not Architecture event? in the past. Can you raise your hand? Okay, a few people, that's not bad. I, was, I thought it would be worse. Um, so, for the new ones, Architects Not Architecture is not about architectural projects, it's about individuals. We often know the projects and awards, and awards of renowned architects, but what we often miss out on are the people behind them, and it's them and their unique career path which influences how, uh, how they work and what they create. So we try to bring to the stage what normally goes unseen. Tonight, our two speakers will talk about their career path, influences, and shaping experiences, which made them who they are today. That way we'll be able to gain a deeper understanding of their work without them even mentioning it. So, in short, the rule is they are not allowed to talk about their own projects. Let's see. Today, 
We will be welcoming our speakers, Angelo Candalepas and Richard Johnson. Each one will have 30 minutes on the stage, um, which includes a 20 minute talk followed by an up to 10 minute interview. After the two talks, we'll have a round of discussion and we look forward to your questions. So make sure you get ready. And for those in this room, you can raise your hand and the ones online, they can use the designated box on our website. After that, we'll have a get together uh, with drinks and food. Interviewing the speakers and moderating the conversation will be the co-founder of the Mill Architecture and Design and the Australian Institute of Architects, President-elect, uh, Shannon Battison. We are extremely thankful that she is moderating today. Thank you. Um, we were not sure if, we, if I was going to be able to travel and Shannon um, was so kind and took the, inf the invitation to moderate tonight. Thank you. She will introduce the speakers and take the event from there. But before that, I would like to thank our partners. Uh, to Mike Atlam of the Australian Institute of Architects for so many conversations which made this possible. To Karina and Lucy, Nicole and Diane uh, and their teams of Akufeld and Semen Concrete and Aggregates Australia for trusting us and our format. And to Brett Wards uh, from Brickworks and their team, Brooke, Katie, Sarah, thank you uh, for making this possible, being the main partner of this event and having us at this beautiful venue. I would like to pass the mic uh, first to Sarah uh, for a few welcome words, and after that, Shannon will take it over. So, thank you a lot. Have fun. <laughs> thank you, Furman. Good evening. My name is Sarah Langbridge. I'm the New South Wales Business Development Consultant for Brickworks Building Products. I'd like to start by congratulating ANA on their first event ever in Australia. And of course, offer our warmest Brickworks welcome to everybody, especially our guest speakers, Angelo and Richard, who we are all really looking forward to hearing from shortly. We are delighted to be co-hosting this event to bring the architectural community together, both here in Sydney, Australia, and online across the world. Brickworks is a leading materials company with manufacturing facilities throughout Australia and the USA. We have a growing network of design studios that can be visited for inspiration and attending networking events like this one, with studios in every Australian capital city, plus Philadelphia, Baltimore, and most recently in Fifth Avenue in New York City. We saw this event as a great opportunity to partner with ANA, as we are also a creator of original architectural content. From podcast series to short architectural films, live stream talks, um, please visit our website, www.brickworks.com.au. There you will find plenty of inspiration and insightful commentary on the challenges and opportunities of this great industry that we're all a part of. So I'll now hand over to Shannon to introduce tonight's speakers and continue the night's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Fermin. Thank you all for coming out. Um, my name is Shannon Batterson. I am the founding director of a Canberra firm called The Mill, and I'm the incoming national president for the Australian Institute of Architects. What a wonderful thing to be invited here tonight, to be a part of this fantastic platform that looks to celebrate architects over the architecture that they create to celebrate the people behind some of the incredible built works that we get to experience all around us. In my own work, I'm really motivated by a deep interest in this intersection between people, place, and the space around us. And this has driven me to become increasingly involved with the Institute in order to advocate, not just for the benefit of good architecture, for both our cities and ourselves, but also for the people behind the built environment. Tonight, we have the very great privilege of hearing from two architects whose work requires no introduction. However, Richard Johnson has led an intensely private professional life, which makes this evening a very rare treat. And whilst I doubt it's possible to be a part of the profession and not have heard of the incredible work of Candelapis Associates, tonight is a wonderful opportunity to hear about Angelo himself and hopefully how his life has influenced the work of his studio. So our first speaker tonight is Richard Johnson. 
Richard was born here in Sydney and studied at the University of New South Wales, graduating in 1969 with first class honours and the Royal Australian Institute of Architects silver medal. He continued his education at University College in London, where he received a Master of um, Philosophy in 1977. Richard's work was celebrated from very early in his career, and he was awarded an MBE in 1977 for his work on the Okinawa Expo 75 in Japan. He is best uh, known as the creator of some of Australia's most iconic and important cultural buildings and spaces of the 20th century, and he has lectured and taught widely. He has been an adjunct professor at the University of New South Wales since 1999. In 2008, he was awarded the Australian Institute of Architects Gold Medal, the highest honour the Institute can bestow for his exceptional body of work and his wider continued contribution to the profession. We're very greatly honoured to have him here on stage tonight. Welcome, Richard. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for that generous introduction, and, and uh, thank you, Furman, for such an interesting format uh, that's, that challenged me. When I agreed to do it, I had no idea I wasn't allowed to talk about buildings. Um, so um, I'm here with, uh, not, not used to talking about myself. Um, so... I thought I'd, it'd show up here. So, um, I was born just after the end of the Second World War into a period of great optimism and opportunity. Um, and as I was the second child of six, and my parents, as was the custom, I think, in those days, moved from, early in my life, moved from the inner city to the bush. Uh, and built a modest house, um, really fronting on to a national park. So I spent most of my youth enjoying that really sharp contrast between the excitement of the inner city and the pleasure and solitude and beauty of the Australian bushland. I spent most of my youth wandering the creeks and gullies and waterfalls of the national park, um, and uh, it's still um, a dear place for me. Um, I had a rather undistinguished and unmotivated schooling and struggled um, to uh, complete it with no distinction, uh, with average results. Um, I think my intellectual life really didn't start until I set foot on the campus at UNSW. It had only four years earlier been declared a university. And even though it was one of Australia's youngest universities, its course structure was still imbued with the Beaux-Arts traditions. In the first common years with the humanities and the arts, students and engineering, we did arts, literature, sciences, philosophy, psychology, sociology, um, uh, and all the performing arts, music, these were core subjects for an architect. Additionally, we spent six weeks crash courses in plumbing, welding, carpentry, joinery, joinery plastering. Um, I wasn't terribly good at any of them. But, however, it was crucial in understanding how buildings are made and, and understanding uh, qualities of materials. Fortunately, I think, in the latter part of our course, um, we were involved in group projects um, with teams of people that included other disciplines. We worked with engineers and we worked even in, in one project with sociologists. And that started, I think, a lifetime interest in working collaboratively with multidisciplinary teams. Our projects were also quite challenging and often um, a complex urban projects, again, whetting my appetite for practice at a larger urban scale. Um, I quickly became um, interested in, in seeking principles that would guide my work. I had a mistrust of my own intuition, and I still do, and so I was constantly seeking um, some ordering device or sets of principles 
that might give me comfort to progress my work. Um, through the module law, I discovered Vitruvius and, and, and later the Greek systems of proportioning, which have guided all of my work for all of my career. I was very influenced by Professor Peter Collar, who led um, the design theory course. Um, he, he got together a group of very distinguished practitioners in Sydney at the time, and they were our design tutors, but he led the design theory. He gave a very famous series of lectures on Siena called 7,000 Facets of Siena, and, and with two towers of, of Kodak carousels, he moved us pace by pace with two projectors through the city, talking about the development of urban form, the history of the city, and, and discussing issues such as duality and symbolism and multiplicity and rhythm and proportion and materiality. Um, very seminal in, in the development of, of my young mind. We're also very fortunate to have visiting professors uh, through my time at UNSW, and we had Buckminster Fuller introducing us to the challenging notions of how much, how much does your building weigh, uh, to, to challenging early notions of sustainability and technology, to Stern Elias Rasmussen, who was Utzon's teacher, um, introducing us to experiencing architecture rather than just creating forms. To Asha, Ashihara, Yoshinobu Ashihara, who gave us an introduction to the mysteries of Japanese architecture, and to the great Christopher Tunnard, who was a landscape architect and planner. So it was a very exciting time for a student uh, at UNSW and a student in Sydney, because in the early part of my career, the Sydney Opera House was emerging in its majesty at Ben Long Point. A group of, of students and I had found a way into the site through, through the security fence, and we often used to run, roam around there undetected at night, just imagining what, what marvels might, might lay ahead of us as it was finished. We were as distraught, of course, and, and felt robbed of, of that great um, completion of the building, and this is a group of my fellow students protesting outside uh, the Opera House when Woodson was forced to leave. I think one regret, and to this day I still have it, that because of the dividedness of the profession, I feel that if the profession had been more united in support of Woodson, we would have seen the completion of the masterpiece. Um, it was also a time when I really started to understand the inspiration and connection between music and architecture. Uh, I was led to, to that through the writings of Kahn, but also through my father, who had a great love of music. And I could see in Bach a uh, structure and space that, that really inspired my thinking uh, of early architectural projects. I graduated, um, much to my surprise, with, with reasonable distinctions. And this is a photograph of my father, who was a very important influence on my life. He was an artist um, with a great and broad interest in life, uh, science, uh, music, uh, and art. Um, and I think it was his influence, and the influence of a very close uh, uncle of mine, who was a builder, and constantly taking me from a young age onto his building sites. I've, I formed a very early interest in watching buildings under construction and, and emerging from the ground. With really the, um, the un... Uh, I can't find the word, but effectively how on earth I could imagine that I could enter an international competition in my first year out as a student and think I could get a place, I have no idea. It was unexpected optimism of youth. And so a mate of mine, Peter, Peter Page and I, entered the two-stage international competition for the extensions to the Houses of Parliament. We were selected to proceed to the second stage 
and I immediately left work, took extended leave, um, went to the bank and got a huge loan um, instead of buying a car and went on a fast trip to London through Greece, through Athens, Rome, Paris before arriving in London for the briefing for the second stage. I think the visit to the Acropolis is always in my memory one of those seminal moments in my life. Um, not only to, to see at first hand many of the things that I'd studied, but also to then discover Doxiardis' theory, 10 and 12 part theory, of the location of buildings in space on ancient Greek sites. And this sense of proportion and order and arrangement of space became, again, crucial to my practice. Um, I, of course, didn't win the competition and um, came back and uh, rejoined the Federal Government Architect's Office and was assigned a building in Japan and formed an association with the great Yoshinobu Ashihara. Um, he was one of Japan's early modernists, and, and you can see his work was inspired by Japanese traditional architecture. He was also interested in, and has written several books on architectural space, external space. He was very interested in, in that, um, in, the, in the division and the blurring of boundaries between internal and external space. He introduced me to Katsura Rikyu and also to Issei, the Issei Shrine. And Issei Shrine in particular um, widened my understanding of heritage, of the importance of buildings, not only as artefacts, but as an embodiment of culture and technologies and craft and the need to preserve those as well as the artefact. And he also introduced me, I think, through Issei into a much broader and richer understanding of sustainability that was not about just the environment, not, a ju not about just the artefact, but also cultural sustainability, sustainability of the, of, of the culture. And, and I think that's a really important lesson that we all should, should uh, learn. I was besotted by Mirei Shigamori, um, an artist who wrote a 35-volume treatise on the history of Japanese, traditional Japanese landscape architecture. And through that knowledge, then in the 1930s, went on to produce his own contemporary interpretation of those traditions. And again, this sparked my interest in what one can learn and adapt to current times from the past. I won a scholarship to study town planning um, and what it was then called a civic design at University College in London at the Bartlett School. Um, and um, and at, at, at this, uh, roughly that, just a, a few years before then, I had the great fortune of meeting and uh, marrying the love of my life, who was a librarian with a great interest and passion for literature, the arts, and history, and, and broadened my perception <coughs> and understanding of so much. We traveled, in the two years we were in London, we traveled extensively in Europe um, and Northern and Central Europe. I was really impressed with Alto's complete understanding of architecture as a practice from the doorknob right to the town plan. To Utzon's Freidenberg and Kingo housing that introduced the sort of humanism in architecture um, and, the, and the way architecture can relate to, to landscape. To Scarpa, who introduced me to an understanding, a deep understanding of crafting a building of materials and of procession, processional sequencing of spaces. And of course, Le Corbusier, and in terms of his, his classicism and surprisingly, his use of colour. 
I was really interested in those architects historically that saw history of architecture as a continuity and, and modern architecture as part of that continuity, not an abrupt shift or change from it. So architects like Gaudi and Hoffmann and uh, Saarinen and Asplund and um, Macintosh and Kahn, who, who, whose, ex, whose contemporary expression was deeply inspired and influenced by a sense of their, the, uh, the, the place within which they were working. I loved the Gothics, cathedrals through Europe, um, and I, I loved the way that structure and decoration and space and material were united in a singular form. And I was delighted to find in the um, Grundewig's church in Copenhagen um, a, a more contemporary inspiration of, of the Gothic. The Alhambra, of course, reinforced in my head this beauty and, and, and magnificence of sequential experiencing of space, moving from one to another, so that, like a piece of music, that the experience of architecture builds um, and it's complete as a symphony, not as a single, singular set of movements, unconnected. <clears throat> I came back from Europe and uh, rejoined the federal government and was given projects in China. And I was, of course, inter fascinated by Chinese perception of space, how the sense of a courtyard and the grouping of space around a courtyard as a concept could apply not only to, to a palace but to a city and indeed to a country, a whole country surrounded by walls and definition of space. Now I regretted I was there in 77, just at the, at the end of the Cultural Revolution. And I regretted the rapid pace to modernise had seen so much of that early work of China um, lose, lose sight of its important heritage and traditions. And fortunately, I think, the more uh, younger generation of architects practising ch in China now have reconnected with, with that past and with that important sense of place. I left uh, the federal government and opened the Sydney office of an international practice um, and had always had the sense that as an architect one had many responsibilities. One had a responsibility uh, to the time, place and technology in which you were building. You certainly had a responsibility to your client, but also to the profession in which you practised. And finally, you had a responsibility to your, yourself and your own values. And if projects were offered where those uh, responsibilities couldn't, couldn't harmoniously align, then it was best not to accept the commission. We. We worked collaboratively. We worked on major projects. And ultimately, Jeff Walker, Adrian Pilton and I demerged from the international practice and, and set up our own office in Sydney called JPW. We took on new partners, um, Paul Van Radigan, Kyung Lee and Graham Dix, and more recently, Matt Morell. And those partners now run the practice. We were interested again in place, the sandstone of the city, in the crafting and the technology of buildings so that they could perform better and use materials more effectively and efficiently, and in the crafting of those materials, in the knowledge that the materials you needed to have about the materials to use them effectively. We were very fortunate in connecting with many of the cultural institutions of the city and the country. Um, and I've always felt that architecture should express the best of our contemporary culture. And if we are to do that, we need to be connected to the, the cultural institutions of the place. I've formed quite close personal friendships 
with many of these people and I think their insights and vision have guided my own thinking. Um, same with artists and photographers. Um, I think I've been responsible for commissioning 40 uh, public artworks for projects that I've worked with. And some of the early ones, the most, the most impressive artists that I've worked with have been the indigenous artists who give really, like all good artists, give great insights um, that as architects we would not have that are really crucial in interpretation of place. In 1998, I was appointed by the Sydney Opera House Trust to advise them on the future of the Opera House and reconnected with Utzon. And the image on the right uh, was one that troubled me from my student days when I saw Utzon's name being taken off the, the construction site. So the first thing I did when Utzon, Utzon's Utzon room was under construction is make a replica of that sign and put his name back on the top. I've taught extensively, um, not only because I think it's an obligation, somebody spent the time to teach me, I have an obligation to pass it on, but also you get enormous benefit and joy in the feedback that one gets from young minds who can see more clearly contemporary issues than somebody who is sort of has a vested interest in the past. I've also had great um, opportunities um, under the inspired leadership of our Lord Mayor and, the, and successive government architects to work on advisory panels and uh, for the City of Sydney and the Government Architects Office. And I think the constant stimulation of debate with your peers about city issues is always, um, always wonderful. Um, I'm very conscious that I've had a very fortunate life. I've learnt much from many. And, uh, and my practice of architecture has been collaborative. Um, one to which I owe a great debt to many of who have worked with me. I've rarely done anything on my own. And I think there are a number of people in the room that I've worked very closely with and thank you for coming. Uh, I wish to end this with a few quotes that constantly echo in my mind um, and continue to inspire my thinking. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act but a habit. Aristotle. The ancient Greeks employed a uniform system in the disposition of buildings in space that, that was based on principles of human cognition, doxiadis. I believe a hidden order to be inherent in the character of Japanese cities and Japanese architecture, Yoshinobu Ashihara. Architects must accept, not accept, the commercial divisions of their profession into urban design, city planning and architecture as though these were three different professions, Louis Kahn. Nothing is as dangerous in architecture as dealing with separated problems. If we split life into separated problems, we split the possibilities to make good building art, alto. I could compose my music to white light which contains all colours. Only a prism can divide the colours and make them appear. This prism should be the spirit of the listener, Avo Peart. At the point of conception of a project must be everything necessary for its execution. Utsun. Thank you very much. Oh, it's an introduction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what are talking about?
to have you here with us tonight. So, um, obviously a lot of your photos had to do with travels and, and um, kind of adventures around the world, I guess, as part of your architecture. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the importance of actually travelling and experiencing things other than... Uh, I think uh, architecture is something to be experienced. And I think um, reading about it uh, or looking at images really tells us only so little. And one has to be there to experience it, to understand it in its richness, to extract knowledge from it that becomes useful. For example, in my generation, it was quite rare that any books or magazines were published in colour. It was black and white after the war. <coughs> so I was shocked when I saw Le Corbusier's work that was colourful. <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> um, from, from the, the literature. So that, I mean, that's one example. But, but architecture is an experiential art. And I think, um, for example, Maureen and I go back to Kyoto almost every year. And we see roughly the same things in Kyoto, but in different seasons. So I can go back to Katsura Rikyu. I, I'm afraid to say it's hard to get into it, but I have been there maybe 12 times. And every time you go, you see something fundamentally important that you missed. So travel, travel is a great source of inspiration. I think there's something inherently powerful, isn't there, about standing inside a building or around a building that we just can't get. I always say to young architects who are, you know, struggling with the degree or, or the, um, you know, the difficulties of, of kind of getting through that there's no um, joy quite like imagining something in your head, convincing a client to build it, showing a builder how you'd like it built and then getting to stand mm. inside something that only existed in your head and I think something like like traveling through you know ancient Greek buildings and, and actually standing in them um, my stepfather growing up was a philosopher in ancient Greek history and so we were as bedtime stories read you know the Iliad and, and things like that and then I remember in year 10 standing you know in these buildings and him telling the stories again and thinking my goodness you know I've grown up to these stories yeah. but actually standing in this building there is nothing that compares no. Um, and, and you can't get the acoustic of it, you can't get the sense on your feet of the tactility of, of the space. Or the play of the shadows no, as light so moves many around things, the space. No, so many things. Um, I'm really curious about why you chose to study planning. Um, I didn't want to be a planner, but planning in those days was associated with what was called civic architecture not urban design, civic architecture, about making cities um, and the responsibility to, to place. Um, I, ch I think my generation generally went, um, went to America for further postgraduate study. Um, I chose London, to, uh, the Bartlett, because Abercrombie founded the planning profession. He was one of the founders and he founded that school and there were still people like Lord Holford teaching there. Um, that was half the reason. The other half was that it was close to Europe <laughs> and, and I could travel. <laughs> so uh, it was fortuitous in, in, in many respects. Yeah. Um, let me choose one of my other questions. I'm a really big believer in the incredible value of having mentors through your career and not just as a young architect but you know throughout your career can you talk to us a little bit about people who you know have had a profound kind of influence on your work and your life well i think i've mentioned many in in the in the presentation but there are a number in the room now um, that have had a great influence on me i think students have a great influence on me because they force you firstly to clarify your own thinking. Um, you have a responsibility to be clear if you hold a particular view 
to know why you do and to impart that knowledge. But you also students, really good students, are challenging. They will challenge that view. They will update it with a more contemporary perspective. So that constant challenge is important. I think mentoring is important because I think divided as a profession, we're weak. We need to be strong to collectively grapple with the issues, the urban issues, the environmental issues that we now face. Um, so mentoring is a way of uniting us so that collectively, in a common way, we can rise to the challenges. I think that leads me to, I wanted to talk about or ask you about the um, importance of collaboration. And one of the things I think that we see as a profession now is this incredible divide. So divide between, say, architects and engineers, civic planners, you know, that we've kind of separated ourselves between architects and builders. And obviously we face as a planet an incredible challenge. Um, there seems to be this desperate need for us to go back to a time where we actually worked together, you know, to solve these issues. So, so many of the worlds, like even politics or, or government administration, is all in separate silos with separate focuses and responsibilities and performance indicators. You know, that's got us nowhere. I think we need to, we need to work together and to understand that a good idea doesn't matter where it comes from. Uh, it's worth debating and, 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 and understanding and, and, if, and, and embracing if it's, if it's leading to, to, to a right good outcome. I think um, as an individual, it's very difficult to achieve anything in the built environment. Even, even as a sole practitioner, you have, to, you have to engage with the planning authorities. You have to engage with the craft people. Um, Good architecture can't be created by one person. Everybody knows that. The, the, the larger the projects that you focus on, the more important collaboration becomes. And I think what one role that the architect can play is to unify and inspire um, a collaborative team of diverse skills and interests, like a composer. Um, not necessarily play each instrument, but understand each instrument and orchestrate the orchestra so that they're playing magic. Um, and in that way, I think that's, that's a task that we're able to do and we're trained to do that others can't. How do you see, um, I think, a common conversation that comes up at the Institute a lot or in, in kind of more public forums is about how architects themselves and our position in society or, or how we're seen by government and our kind of our, our usefulness, for want of a better word, has kind of diminished in Australia over, over the decades. How do you think we go about um, you know, strengthening that voice and strengthening what it is we bring to our cities and our, our placemaking um, powers. I, I think we start by, by being more collaborative as a professional group. Um, um, I think we start by sharing knowledge generously and openly. We start by having um, serious debate um, and embracing different perspectives and different points of view um, and, 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 and thinking about them. Um, no, no individual has all of the answers or, or the right answers all of the time. So an open mind is necessary. But um, I think there's great inspiration from nature, from history, from allied fields like philosophy and music and, and, and I think we are, if we are to be the best architect uh, we can be as an interpret, interpreter of the best of our age, then we'd be, we've got to be connected um, with everything that's happening as much as we can. 
and, and we can't do that as individuals. We do it through others working with us to open our eyes uh, to possibilities. Now, I should probably have checked the time before I got up, but is somebody keeping time and going to... I'd like to ask a question. Absolutely. I don't think I can ever say no to um, Glenn Merkitt. <laughs> Richard, um, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, firstly. Uh, the question I have is this, that tonight you've shown those professionals that have been very influential in your life. And most of them are in themselves individuals. And in a practice, there probably has to be somebody who has the mind to carry the practice, whether it be a small practice or a large practice. So the collaboration comes in as a consequence of, very often, a very strong mind. Hmm. So it's not entirely a collaboration from the outset. What would you like to say about that? I probably wouldn't like to admit that. <laughs> 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 but I probably agree with you. <laughs> yeah. I think to get anything done as an architect, you've got to be bloody minded. You can't, you can't give in. Um, minor compromises on a daily basis over a five year or 10 year period of building a major building ends up in disaster. You've got to hold the line, but you can't do it on your own. Um, I don't know, I haven't answered. The line is on your own. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I probably haven't answered your question directly. <laughs> There'll be more time. Okay, have we reached our, our thing? All right. Thank you. I'm going to thank you very much for that. Angelo was also born here in Sydney. He graduated from the University of Technology in 1992, and two years later he established his own architecture studio, which in only its first months of practice, won an international competition for the Point Apartments in Piedmont. In 1999, he established Candelapis Associates. Over the next 25 years, his Sydney-based firm has won a significant number of awards, including the Australian Institute of Architects Solomon Medal for Public Architecture, the Frederick Romberg Award for Residential Architecture, the Harry Seidler Award for Commercial Architecture, the Aaron Bollett Award for Residential Architecture, and no doubt many more. He was made a Life Fellow of the Australian Institute of Architects in 2019, and in 2020 he was presented with the University of Technology Alumni Award for Design, Architecture and Building, recognising his commitment to the profession. He has recently been selected by the Victorian Government and the National Gallery of Victoria to design NGV Contemporary, Australia's largest gallery dedicated to contemporary art and design, and we are very grateful to have him here with us today. Welcome, Angelo. <clears throat> that was, um, I was obeying the command of my phone when I got up. It says stand, you know, it says stand. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk, and in particular, to talk beside one of my mentors, um, Richard Johnson. Um, what I want to do is start to talk about those things that embed values. I thought that's what actually um, I needed to talk about, and in fact, I thought actually that's not that there's not ma that many engagements in architecture when it comes to that in my life. These are my values. I believe in a greater power, one that engages with, with us in the universe every day. I have faith in God. I care for the human condition of seeking rituals and seek the human condition of spirituality. I am not overwhelmed by figures of authority or fame. I have a deep sense of my capacity to be that which is greater than I know. 
I seek an eternal dimension whilst knowing life is finite. I understand history is key to developing an optimism for the future. I understand that language is rich with humanity and that cultivation of one's soul is also cultivation of one, one's understanding of language. And there are many languages, but in the most part there are the languages we speak, there are the languages in architecture of experience, there are the languages of music, but all linked to the cultural dimension. I understand that there are many languages that have something to do with the personal associated with something incredibly universal. I also have to say I am totally bilingual. I think and speak and write in two languages, I would say, equally. I also like silence when I'm working and listening to music when I don't want to be thinking. I don't like thinking. I don't think the conscious effort creates great architecture. I don't believe in this idea of total empiricism. I think it's a kind of, it's the furphy of the one-dimensional person. And I'm not concerned about doing something that no one else is doing. And I'm not that easily bullied. I am deeply entrepreneurial and have a healthy relationship with risk. <laughs> These are just some thoughts. I don't know how to start the button. Do I start the button with this? I don't know. Okay. I, I have a different way of seeing, perhaps, to what Richard was seeing. And maybe I made a mistake. Because I really like the, the rendering of um, influences to architecture. But um, for me, why is this moving? It's very annoying, isn't it? It's constantly moving. It's, um, there's a screen here with the television. Um, I come, my heritage comes from this place in Greece. Uh, I'm the first generation born here. And actually, um, this place was written about in 467 BC. And it's a place that was discovered by the early Greeks as a place which was fertile. It's Arcadia. Um, the word comes from a mythological uh, fig figure, Arkas, which actually starts the world. Arkas is the beginning, Arcadia. Interestingly, um, uh, it was occupied by the Franks, Guillaume the um, second. It was uh, established in the generations that created my heritage in um, the 13th and the 14th century. It was built over um, over 40 years, but um, in the in in the in the village my parents are from um, is. A, um, is an ancient theatre, Orhomenos, which is the equivalent size of the ancient theatre um, of um, Epidavros. Um, and also uh, very close by is an early Doric temple. We consider ourselves as part of the Doric race in a sort of legacy. Um, uh, and uh, these temples uh, were made over a period of 500 years. Um, and they were in the Peloponnesus. The Peloponnesus, from my parents' point of view, is Venetian. It has a sort of link to um, uh, uh, the in terrible conflicts with Russian um, people who were trying to occupy it. Um, and in fact, um, in 1700, uh, there were people called clefts. Our name was Cordis um, prior to the 1700s um, because of the way that um, my ancestors would hold themselves. Um, they would hold themselves in their jackets. And it would look like you're kind of making fun of someone, so they called this. Um, my great ancestors in the 1700s were the um, ultimate. Um, they got fed up of the Ottomans in the 1700s. They, weren't, they actually liked the Ottomans. Um, they preferred them to the Venetians because at least they weren't Catholic, is what my, um, what my parents would say. Um, and they would say, well, you know, at least they let us alone. All I have to do is carve the ice out and give them tax. Uh, my great-great-great-great-grandfather would have to give them tax. by And then they got a bit sick of that. Um, in the 17 and 1800s, 
Why I'm telling you all of this is because this is what is told to us as we're growing up by my great-grandfather. Also, what on earth were the French doing in Arcadia, painting pictures? Um, I, too, have travelled to Arcadia by Poussin um, in Latin. But what was interesting is that they believe, our, our relatives believe that they were the owners of the Greek Revolution. They were the owners of the Greek Revolution in 1821. Because just in the next village, um, there was this enormous commencement of the Great Revolution in 1821, which in fact was particularly, particularly important. The village um, in the German uh, period had many, many planes um, that had come down. This is the village. Um, what was interesting is it was built um, in the 50 years from 14, uh, 1360 to 1400, um, just before the end of um, the Ottoman Empire, and it was built off the um, Epidavros uh, equivalent, or Homenos. They just took the stones. So actually it's built from stone that has been taken out of the earth since 467 BC. We are, this is a little San Andrea, the, the, uh, Agios Andreas, at the top of the, uh, at the top of the village, um, they built this because they had an idea that um, Saint Andrea was there. But he's the Greek. He's the Greek saint. We grew up with this in our psyche. This is how we existed in our psyche through living. And of course, this is the monastery. I went there in '91 for the first time. People would say, "Oh, you're going back to Greece?" No, I said I've never been actually. Um, but I went there knowing how to speak Greek in the kind of almost Latin Greek that my parents had taught me, um, which was really troublesome because people would say, which part of Italy are you from? Um, and I'd say, I'm not, I'm not Italian. But I have this kind of formal Greek. Um, the, the thing that's interesting is that um, they had to leave because after they got very excited about the wars that started in 1821, they actually wars in the 1700s. So 1700s, all the way through, they got sick of the war. They wanted to now be in a revolution, 1821 to 1828. They become this kind of fantastic thing. For a few years, they were having war against each other. Then they suddenly decided to have World War One. Then they suddenly decided to have this thing called the Great Idea in 1922. Then they suddenly decided to have World War Two. Then they suddenly just ha decided to have uh, an internal revolution. My my father was born in 1941, or 40, um, 18th of October 1940, 28th of October is Orchidei, no, we said no, M Mussolini thought it was a great idea that the Greeks, because we're the same race, you know what I'd say, they, they would just come, and half of Greece was actually occupied by Italy, of course they would come, and the, the, the Greek president said no, and then my grandfather had to go to war. 10 days after my father was born, leaving my grandmother, and then they came back after the war. Luckily, he didn't die, and my father, uh, uh, and my, my uncle uh, was blown up by um, a hand grenade that he picked up, thought it was a toy. This is the sort of thing that we got as stories when we were young, and it was fantastic because you got all these stories and you could see my uncle's chest was open um, and he almost died. Um, I, this was... This was the Patris, but this was the Elinis. And my parents, my mother was, my mother was, um, my mother wasn't offered to anybody, but her sister was. And my Theatula was offered to my father. And she said, I'm not going to marry that man. I don't want to marry that man. And so my, my, my grandfather said, okay, you're going to do it. He picked her up. You're going to do it. And so my mother married my father. It was lovely. Um, they had an engagement. She had to come to Australia early because he, her, it was ridiculous. Um, my auntie decided to go back and left my... She sponsored my mother and she went... And anyway, so my father came a year later um, and started bringing his whole family. And they came in ships like this. A ship that needed... That was good for 500 people suddenly could have 2,000 people. And um, they were coming to this. This is 1960. 65 Australia with half of the Opera House. Similar story but from another position. What is this building? Why are they building a mushroom? Why are they building this building? Um, and there are buildings like this. It's a mess. How can, how can they live like this? My father landed in Stanmore in Ferris Street and 
he walked onto Parramatta Road and spent the evening walking um, left because he was told that's where the city was, looking for the piazza. Um, and he said, there's no piazza. He ate a whole banana with a... I mean, he was just, anyway, the, the whole thing was very, this is a photograph of coming around, this is what they saw. What are they building here? Why? Why are they building opera? What is opera? You know, this sort of thing. Um, so they came to Australia. This is, a vi this is a picture of what happened. They wanted to build a church. So they first bought this church in Belmore. They moved from, because my father had a beautiful house, he could sell it to pay for all of the relatives to come. Well, that's the end of it. Oh, this is technology. You make it good. I need more time for this. This is not good. Yeah. I, it, if, if I, I'm not going to put up with this rubbish. No, if you, if you stop, you have, the time has to start. I had... <laughs> we can stand to question time. Anyway, my... my, my um, what was very interesting, oh, my grandparents were born in 1908, 1924, 1906 and 1911. My parents, 1940 and 1942. And I thought that's a kind of good statistic. We're here. And so they built all this thing. And what I, you know, they built this. And part of it was the community. And it was, you know, you really, it was like, I, when I read in year eight, The Little World of Don Camilo, which was, you know, about a priest and the difficulties he had in community, I thought, oh my God, it's just like us. They hate the priest, but they love the priest. They want the priest, but they can't. It's just... So they built this church, and there's the archbishop. He's this great poet. He's one of my first mentors. One year I was stupid enough to be elected president, and that's the priest. Um, I was secretary for 12 years, um, and I was writing all of the minutes in Greek, but you know, a demotic Greek, this thing. And there's my mum and dad, um, very proud that you know, they built the church. He was saying the other day at Easter, I'm so glad we got, we got the handrails put in in 1974. And I thought, okay, fair enough. Um, but but this, is, this has been my life, pebble created ground. Um, and I, this bishop started the church and he's now in Melbourne, which is a very intriguing thing because I go to Melbourne and he's actually a person who started our church, which is kind of where I belong. I belong in Melbourne. Um, we used to go to the train station because all of our relatives were in Melbourne and they would go by train. And I couldn't see the structure. I just remember all of these beautiful signs. And all I could remember is, I want to, I want to build signs when I grow up, you know? Um, <laughs> Anyway, and so we had this kind of, there were moving signs and my grandmother would come out and it was fantastic. There she is. And it's very funny because she was 16 when she got married, couldn't read or write. Um, and there's a sort of function with my father. And what's interesting is she always wore this thing um, because it was like this kind of link to ancient Christendom. Um, and, oh, this is a good photo. I went to Harcourt Public School in Campsie and in 1976... Um, I met Mary, who is my wife. <laughs> now, Mrs. Hutchinson was a, was, a, was a great old crow. She was horrible. And, the la and we thought she was a witch, actually, because she didn't come up to the photographs. And my sister said, you know, she's a witch, because witches don't like to be photographed. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> and so we had this lady whose name I do not know, but what you need to know is I, when I was young, I would be the interpreter for my parents from first grade at the parent teacher nights. I soon learnt the advantage of this um, because you could, you could just say things that the teachers would nod. Until I got to high school, and I've got to tell you, my headmaster, who could speak Greek, had a problem um, with Angelo, you know, this sort of thing. Um, this was the. This is an image of um, a beautiful book that I bought um, of one of the. There, there, there are two um, poets in Greece that are really. There are many poets, but two that are Nobel Prize laureates. Um, maybe three. Um, and this is a book of Yuri Seferis. He he had these pictures that he did in the book, which I thought was how amazing you can make these pictures and be a poet. I mean, how amazing. Um, this is what we had to do. We had to say the George Seferis poems, that's me, had to say in the Greek national costume, and every year we had a thing called examinations, and the examinations were actual poetry. 
And what my mother would revel in is, oh my God, this is a perfect opportunity for you to do this poem. <laughs> like this. And I would have to learn poems that were, you know, had footnotes. Um, and everyone else was not learning the poem. And this is Greek dancing. We had to do Greek dancing, of course. And of course, I was here. This is my Greek dancing dance. And these are all people that are my friends. And this is my cousin, who is a kind of weirdo, um, but lovely. <laughs> Lovely. And so this is Ulysses. His name is Ulysses, or Theseus. And we spent the whole of our youth kind of pretending we weren't in Australia. Um, this is <laughs> this lady, my first true mentor, Mrs. Augustinos. Now, if you know anything about the Greek um, heritage, Augustinos is not a Greek name. Um, it's Italian. Augustus. Augustus. Um, why, would you, why would you call someone Augustinos? But... She was from the Ionian Islands, from a place called Kerkira, which is Corfu, and they, she taught me about Gandathis, she taught me Venetian Greek. And the other thing that she did was she was constantly impressing upon my parents, and my parents absolutely loved her because she was the most educated person um, we knew. She had gone to high school. She had gone to year 10. And she was the most educated person we knew. And she would have the most... And in Greece, you would be educated, right? Um, you would be properly educated. The thing that was interesting is I didn't discover that I was kind of blind until year eight. And so up until that time, I thought the moon looked like this, and I thought, you know, the whole world looked like, you know, a Turner painting. Um, and I couldn't understand why people were saying, you're not wearing a school uniform, when I had a dotted, uh, a dotted shirt, but it looked grey in the mirror, you know. And I thought, well, that's grey. No one will know that I'm wearing a, not a grey. And I would wear this. And they would just say, he's just Greek. He doesn't have a uniform. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what, what we did was we had this thing where I would see the most in intricate detail and draw it. My mother, of course, in the inimitable style of my mother, threw all of my drawings out. She would say, this is rubbish. This is rubbish. What throw? And throw it out. Why have rubbish? And, of course, she would put it in a, in a wheelbarrow um, and ceremoniously throw it out every year. And I had these beautiful drawings that we never had. The other thing that they... Were, I th they used to get advice, my parents. You must go to learn the instrument. Music. Okay, piano, piano. So we learnt piano. I learned piano from first grade in primary school till second year at university, and I couldn't stop. And what I had was this absolute preoccupation. This is where we merge, I think. <laughs> absolute preoccupation with a universal language. Um, these, these are the two-part inventions by Bach, and we started the book, and I just finished the book, and I forgot about the lessons. Oh, I forgot to tell you, there were two things. There are two things about Mrs. Augustinos. She made us learn. She said, I've got a really good idea. Why don't we do a play, Greek school? It's afternoon Greek school. Afternoon Greek school. We're going to do a play. Antigone. So she gives me the lead part because I'm so smart and I can learn the lead part. And so I learn the lead part, as I do, and my friends in the audience will know, as soon as I get an assignment, I start. So I learn the whole lead part. And I learn it, and it's fantastic. And then she said, look, I've changed my mind. <laughs> We're not going to do Antigone. We're going to do the Greek Revolution, which is really your ancestors, Angelo. So let's do the Greek Revolution. And I thought, she's right. So if I go home and I tell my parents that I'm doing Antigone and learning it in ancient Greek, they'll say, what is this? If I go and tell them we're learning about, you know, the, 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 the clefts in the mountains that were your grandfathers killing people with their own hands in the, in the, Russian, revolution, the Russian war and also um, the Russian, Russian upheaval and also then the war of independence. Well, well, that's something to learn. Um, and so we learned that and did a whole play. And then, of course, these are my cousins in Mel some of my cousins in Melbourne. I absolutely love them. This is my sister. Um, they are also mentors. They help me understand the interface between this difficult period. I had the privilege of um, going to a school where Lloyd Rees, and this is him at 90, or just a little bit older, but I was one of the few students, because I could draw, that was elected to go to his 90th birthday at the school. And he just was really, you know, that 
Those occasions where you'd meet people like this were pretty special, and then you'd understand actually they're people. This is my school university card. Um, <laughs> I had this knack of always having my eyes shut in everything that I said. Anyway, and after six terrible interviews, um, and high school was finished, terrible interviews, um, my, my mother said, I, did, I flunked in art because I did a controversial artwork, and this is the way of my life. Um, I did something that offended somebody, which was good to offend people. Good, I said. But it meant I got something like 12% for art, because those years you didn't have anything but the mark for the artwork. And I did three unit art and I flunked. And I couldn't go to the University of Sydney, which I wanted to go because I liked the buildings. I couldn't go to the University of New South Wales, which I didn't want to go because it was so far, but I would have liked because of the prestige. And I ended up at a place called the University of... What was it? The Institute. The New South Wales Institute of Technology. And I had to get a job, and I went for six job interviews, and I had enough of this rubbish, one after the other. And I sat in Jack Torzillo's office, who was the partner, and he had a cigar because there was no room, and he was doing a sketch, and Mike Rolfe was interviewing me while he was doing a sketch with a cigar going, are you finished? That sort of thing. Um, and I said, well, are you finished? You know, this is ridiculous. I'm sick of this. And I said, you're never gonna get, you're never gonna get that drawing done with a cardigan to do the, to do the imprint. He said, what, what do you mean? It's gonna be, they're gonna go through the tracing paper, it's gonna be rubbish. And he said, how would I do it? I said, you have to actually do every dot. You have to sit there and do every dot. And he said, you're right. I do have to sit here and do every dot. And you're hired for $3 a year. <laughs> um, and Carl Madigan, <laughs> it was just no risk, you know? And then Carl Madigan, um, saw me um, one day because I went to see what he was doing um, with the National Gallery and it was wonderful because I had ended up having this 20-year discussion with him about it. And this is here in my house. I have pictures of him helping my kids colour in. He's been an important part of my life. This is a sketch of a university work. They were wondering where the windows were. I said, why do you need windows in a building? I mean, come on. This was a winery, why do you need windows? Um, why doesn't the air just go through? And um, I had deigned to decide on that occasion that I should actually have a tutor who would not be interested in architecture so I can do what I want. Because unlike Richard, um, we were in the years where architectural education was starting to decline, let's say. Um, it is something so special now, I know, but it had started to decline. And I, I got, I did, it was a good strategy because I got an HD because he wasn't looking. Um, this is my grandmother. This is my grandfather. They're, they're my grandparents. We lived together um, with the family and sometimes we lived with both grandparents and would get in the car and go to Melbourne and start at two in the morning and so we would, because there was no air conditioning with all the kids in the station went, it was a disaster. Crystal vases, cigarette ashtrays, totally used all the time. Um, and why I'm mentioning that is because my grandmother was, um, had, had fallen, uh, she'd, she'd had a stroke in the village and we were kind of taking care of her and she had this dream that she was going to die in Australia so she decided that she was going to get everybody to make her go to Greece and my uncle had come and I was drawing this drawing at the University of Technology. And I was drawing this drawing, and it was a big AI drawing. You could imagine how big it is, and it's quite beautiful when you see um, the drawing. Um, and I, I, my grandmother decided to have a massive... My, when they were all out, <laughs> it's like a Woody Allen movie. They were all out, buying shopping, like something. Um, and I drew this thing, I was drawing this thing, and my aunt, my mum my said, just take care of your grandmother, don't keep doing the things you do. Why are you drawing all day? Um, go downstairs, give her her tablets. And I sat next to her on the bed and she had a massive stroke and she died in my arms. And so I thought, you know, what do I do? Call the ambulance or go up and finish my drawing. So I thought I should call the ambulance. Um, and so I told the professors at the university that I might not have all the plans finished because it was due the next few days. 
And I got this as a message. Well, it's only your grandmother. Um, and actually, no, you won't get an extension. Um, what you need to do is, young man, get serious about your education and um, get on with it. Um, to which I said, OK. By the way, this was a scheme that I drew in pencil with much love. And um, this section, when I presented it, I refused to get a critique from um, the rather unintelligent person that was teaching us. And he scrapped it. He was drunk. This is what people do. They get drunk if they're teaching at university in the 90s or 80s. And he, he, scrapped, here, he scrapped it here. He pulled it off the wall. Um, and I thought, I'll just draw it again. Um, and I did. Um, but these were the sort of drawings that I was producing. I think it's very interesting that I was preoccupied with this sort of enlightenment architecture. It's very interesting that I have this idea that maybe we can have a Euclidean or Platonic or Pythagorean idea about the universe. Um, these were, they created a, a rule after that, actually, that because I had 20 drawings and it was like wallpaper, um, they created a rule that you must do everything on one drawing. This is a bad reproduction of it. So I did, all, I did everything on one drawing and created in miniature all the plans and they got even more angry with me. Anyway, I failed these things because um, I was kind of not interested in getting critiques from people who had no reason to be respected. I mean, they, they need to, you need to have a reason to be. I mean... You came to university with me. It was a disaster. It was like, take the check every fortnight. Anyway, I was obviously intrigued with Khan. I was obviously intrigued. And one of the people that introduced me to Khan um, was Peter Cavellis, who's sitting in here, and I'll talk to you about him later. This is a drawing for my first competition. Technically, it's not actually the work of my practice because I didn't have a practice when I did this. I was in my parents' um, house, still living there because I was earning $3 a week at Edwards Madigan, um, and I had no money. So this is a drawing that I, was produce, I produced with pencil and ink, and they're sort of drawings that I produced in the competition with enormous love. A 0.13 pen those days. Every stone was drawn by me. Um, it was a, a passionate, passionate process of absolute intent. This was the sort of section of the building. And we've recently photographed it for a publication out of Switzerland that um, absolutely loved the idea that I did this when I was 26. And they thought, oh my God, how could you possibly have done that when you were 26? I, 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 I do wonder, actually, but anyway, um, I was pretty interested in just the stuff. Um, we reused all of the stone of the site that existed. Um, the builders at the time wanted us to throw it away. Um, I insisted that we reuse it all. Um, it was a very important building for my career that was in many respects an art of failure, <laughs> but in many respects it's what, what I knew. What I knew of my parents' village, what I knew of um, what society could offer at its best, what I knew what, uh, what could be optimistic. People lived like this in the things that were of my dreams, of my parents' stories. We live through our parents, I think. We live their life, and we have to, so that we don't actually waste our life learning what they know. Um, you can be very arrogant about um, you can be very arrogant about it, but I think it's important to let it, let it in. These things are. People say, oh, you're very Spanish. I said, I'm very Greek. <laughs> but I'm not Greek because I'm Australian. And what's important about the Australian condition is that it must accept that people have come here from all over the world and they have something to offer. It can't be this... Can you please be quiet? <laughs> it's just outrageous, isn't it? No, it's okay. I mean, you would have been a great student, wouldn't you? Um, anyway, so... <laughs> Um, this is a drawing again in colour. Um, and these were the preoccupations. Now, where did I learn these? Glenn had come in as probably one of the few people at the university and he was talking to us about how the sun moved around buildings. Um, I, I, I couldn't believe how intelligent it was because it was actually what my parents would say. We had two rooms 
Angelo. Why people don't have a room in the sun, why people don't have a room in the shade. We had two rooms. We had the sun room and we had the shade room. And under the house, you went when it was hot. My parents' house was one of those houses and they still have it. We, I've been told I'm not going to inherit it because my son will inherit it because he's something better than me. But anyway, um, my father, my mother said, oh, this is going to be your house when we went to see it, to my son. So I don't, I, they buy, it's like the English royal family. But anyway, um, this was another idea. The art in nature always intrigued me. Um, I don't know why it's not quickly going. I've got to get quickly out. The second major competition we were shortlisted for was the National Museum of Australia. I'll just go through quickly. Um, Carl Madigan had helped me enormously in this. And he had been incredibly instrumental. In fact, for the, for the, for the national, for the competition for the Piedmont, everyone hated the fact that a 26-year-old had won it. And we went into Tusculum, the Institute of Architects, and they were screaming, not knowing that I was in the audience. And I stood up and Cole said, sit down, don't say anything, and for God's sake, don't cry. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he's right. Um, and so when we didn't win this, um, Ashton Raggett McDougall won this. Um, I must admit, I was looking through the cracks to see the other scheme, and there was a scheme that looked like lollipops to me, and I said, oh, phew, we've got one less competitor, and that was the one that won. Um, <laughs> but it's okay, it's okay, because um, I wasn't in Canberra at the point in time when I would have met my wife again in a reacquaintance. And what's so beautiful about that serendipity is that I got a better deal than a bad building at the peninsula, I got, I got to meet my wife and we got married. And that was better than this stupid building anyway. She was amazing because we started with this competition and she would say to me, Angelo, you've spent so much money on the competitions. Oh my God, oh my God, we don't have any money to spend because she's like, it's fantastic, fantastic accounting genius and so what she does is she helps me by reminding me that actually everything that I do costs money. Ruby um, Madigan would be writing me letters at the same time because one of the things that I was preoccupied with was the establishment of some sort of uh, some sort of reputation for the National Gallery and this is fantastic because this is one of the letters that Ruby Madigan wrote me um, because um, Cole, Cole had called the schemes shit and I said, why don't you use the French word, adieu? And he, she said, oh, we'll do this. We'll, we'll call it adieu. You know, we'll, do, we'll have this um, other way of speaking now, which is like French. Uh, I learned from my uh, Greek parents that you could have a, a golden tongue. Chrysostom um, is, oh, these are my kids. This is, this is the epitome of what my children are like. This is my beautiful wife. This is my daughter. <laughs> and how she behaves with the Santa Claus evil man. And this is my son, completely oblivious to it. Um, and both of them are in the design industry now. They're ed getting educated to become budding designers, which is fantastic. My son wants, I didn't, know, I didn't know about it. And this is what we would get. We would get these things. And these for me are very inspirational because when children say something is important, it's important. So this is what we did in the summer holidays. And have a good look at the sad and the happy. Sad is raining, happy is the sun. And this is an indifferent one with a straight face. This is what we're all supposed to be as professionals, indifferent, you know, competent. Um, in the holidays, we celebrated Christmas. It was long and enjoyable. I, I don't know how those two can be the same. And then <laughs> there was the fireworks. We went to Nelson Bay. This is actually a very good rendering of where we would go in Nelson Bay. It wasn't our place, but it was our place. And then we flew, and this is a really good rendering of our house. And I think it's kind of interesting to see what they see, particularly of our house. He, it was a shock to us when he wanted to do architecture. I don't know why it was a shock. We're so stupid because this is a drawing of his as an eight-year-old of Ronchamp. Like, and this is who he decided <laughs> to be. He decided to be Corbusier. And all the books were out. And I said, who told him the glasses? He found them. He put the jacket on. He drew Ronchamp. And we were off. Um, <laughs> the, the bishop was so beautiful um, because they gave me the commission to do All Saints School. 
And they gave it to me with really no competitors. But if I show you the donations, it was in the hundreds of thousands. The f I would get a fee, and if the bill was $50,000, I would give $25,000 back. And it was a pleasure, because this is, m this is my work. This is my community. This is a fantastic speech that I wrote to thank them at the end of... We won the Sulman Medal, but actually it was not relevant because they've been, they, they put me forward as this patron of um, their yearly event. And they asked me to say thank you. And I wrote this beautiful, beautiful, um, beautiful speech that finishes with Philostratos, who says, gods, gods can see the future. People that are wise have a sense of prescience. And everyone else just feels things, which is a beautiful sense of who we are. We can get closer to kind of perfection if we see the future. But having prescience is absolutely mandatory. I had this desperate moment that I wanted, and I didn't know why, I wanted Glenn and Wendy to meet my headmaster and his wife. And I wanted them because, I don't know why, do you remember that? And we had dinner at my house. Within three months, he got a really big issue of cancer and died. And he wrote this beautiful, beautiful card. Um, I don't actually know why there's Greek writing on it, but I think it's because on the other side of it, it's Peloponnesus money, the tower, he knew where my parents were from. He knew that next door was this great, great place. Now, we get to Richard. Now, one of the things that I'm sorry for getting images, one of the things that I have to say is I actually dropped a girlfriend because she said she didn't like that building, Richard. <laughs> and and I, just, I just said, oh my God, oh my God, in a minute you're going to tell me all sorts of weird things, like you're very, very right wing or something. Um, and so um, I, 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 I want to show you the legacy of our city and what we've lost as well in this picture. And what I, I googled the black stump because I thought there was a relationship with it that was beautiful and I found this image and I'm sorry it's got Getty images, but it also has some significant works of our city. Now, my parents came in 1965, and you saw what the city looked like. In between, we've had masterpieces and rubbish. And Richard, in, on the 30th of January, 2014, we had just come back from Japan, and I had decided we weren't going to go to Ise, because if my daughter was who she was, she would roll her eyes when we would go to Alva Alto's house and say, oh my God, not another house. And if I said another temple, she would have a fit. But... I shouldn't blame her because she would have come. We decided it was not the right time for us to go. But Richard gave me this beautiful, beautiful Svenfas rendering of Ise, which actually had critical dates from the first period every 20 years. And I wrote him a beautiful letter extolling the virtues of mentorship and friendship because Richard also... Um, is someone mowing the lawn? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it didn't have the battle ag agging court on it. I think I said that or something. I'm going to be very quick. This is my son at school. But what's interesting is Roderick West, my headmaster, who I love, was sitting above his head in this photo. And I thought he was like this angel that protected us. He would be the person who would inspire me to do architecture. He would be the person to inspire me to not be embarrassed of being Greek. He would say, this is your time. He would say, he would speak in this, in the poor English, they don't know how to speak Greek. You know, they would say, we would say, he would say, you know, it was, how could you speak like that? Um, what was interesting... Oh, this is my daughter to show you how resilient she is. She's cutting onions 
Um, and these are the sort of characters I have in my, in my house, and they're very inspiring. I go home every night because I want to hear my children talk. I want them to say something. Above my desk at home, Carl Madigan had wanted to give me something, and I didn't take it. And on his deathbed, he gave it to his son, who, when we went to Byron Bay to visit him, said, I, I have to give you this. Dad wanted you to have that. He had a space in Collaroy um, at the basin, which he would give us whenever we wanted to go. Um, and he was just so nice. Um, this is Phil, um, one of the great friends of his here, one of the great friends of our life. Um, we've known him for 30 years. Mary, Mary's known him. And we've known these people for so long. And he's now helping me run our practice, which is fantastic, and do the work that I'm doing on the National Gallery. Um, these are my beautiful friends. This is me. This is Mary, Leah, David Boyle, Suzanne, and John. Suzanne, in her dad's RX-7, came to take me with John to submit the Piedmont Point competition entry. And I'll never forget it because we were so late, because she was dry. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, this, is our, um, this is one of the celebrations. Um, for Mary and I have joint birthdays, and we had it up at our house in Kilcare. And this is a celebration for our 50th with beautiful, beautiful friends. And Peter and Suzanne and John are there, but they're not shown. And my brother, he looks like the person from the village. You know, he's fantastic in that. Um, we have the benefit of someone who's... It's not well known, but actually um, one of my best friends has also won the Pritzker. And we haven't told many people this. He works in our office. It's such a privilege to have him in our office. And Glenn even wrote an SMS in a little letter to explain what a privilege it was to have another Pritzker Prize winner in our office. Um, and, and that's winner. The, I wondered why, and when I reflected on it, I wondered why I like these Louis Kahn drawings. They looked like Yorgi Seferi's drawings to me. They looked like the landscape drawings. They were Greek, in a sense, because they understood the sort of ancients of communicating without words. And this is my house. Why I did this is I said, look, you know, Dad, we bought a house. Where is the house? It's further away from us. You're moving from Campsie to where? Gleep. Gleep. That's where all the gypsies are. <laughs> and I said, no, but it's Arcadia Road. <gasps> Arcadia? So he would be very proud because he's a builder. And that's one of the other things that I can't talk to you about. But he would be very proud helping build this house. And he would say, you have to come to my son's house in Arcadia Street. <laughs> and they say, what's Arcadia Street? It's Arcadia Street. It's where we're from. So I'm back to where we're from. Um, this is George Braque. Again, anything that has to do with this kind of primacy of colour. Um, what, what I think is important is the words in the liturgies, not the Bible, are very important to me. And I'm not going to translate this. Um, I'll, I'll, trans I'll translate one of them, um, but uh, uh, there's, my favourite service is on Easter Tuesday, and we've just had it, so it's very, it's very present. And the ancient Greek is the most beautiful, beautiful language because it has this sort of power to really resonate. And I don't want to translate it on the, on the foot, but um, this, is a, this is what this is saying. O oh, blind... O oh, blind and implacable avarice, how is it that you forgot what you have been taught, that you are a soul whose worth the world does not equal? It's such a beautiful statement. You are a soul whose worth the world does not equal. I get a lot of out of that, actually. And this is another one which is even more beautiful. May we be delivered from the spirit of indolence, meddling, vain ambition and vain talk. It's a prayer. May we be delivered from the spirit of indolence. Don't be lazy. And it's my faith. This was an attempt to consider to consider the opera house if there were three parts to it, which is interesting. 
Another mentor is Tsamulos, who died last year. He, was a kind, he said he was my uncle, but he wasn't my uncle. He was delusional. Um, and he was delusional. We used to call him Beethoven because he had this hair. But he gave me this book of Elitis, Axion Esti. And he wanted to introduce me to a friend of his who died last year, um, Mikis Theodorakis, who is a brilliant musician. And he put that book to music, and it's become an incredible work, and I listen to it as often as I can. It's one of the things that I listen to. And it reminds me of the simplicity of this beautiful sketch of Richter. The clouds, the landscape, and a person. That's the book. This is Glenn. He's been an absolute influence in my life. Um, and he's so generous. He's influencing my son. I'm going to be emotional now. This is Kavafi, another amazing poet in Greek. I'm not showing you Eliot because you can read it. And just in the spirit of me translating and being in control, um, I'm telling you this is a beautiful poem. This is I gave to art. Art in Greek is techni. There was no differentiating between art and technique. Um, I sit and muse to will emotion. This is a beautiful way of talking. This is what inspires me in the way that I think. I sit and ruse to will emotion. I brought to art something half seen, faces and lines, faces or lines, unfinished affairs. It's beautiful, isn't it? And the poem can be like this or like this. This is from another person, which I'm almost ended now. It's only another 20 minutes to go. Between the two bitterness of moments, you don't have time to breathe. Between the two bitterness of either side of the moments, you don't have time to breathe. Between your face and between your face, between your face and between your face, one tender form of a child writes something and then it disappears. It's beautiful. And this is what my life is like. I go to Suzanne's house and John's house and we have these wonderful things. They're kind of this big family. God knows what has just happened. But it's the thing in life that I love, that something always happens. And this is the thing that is my life with what Wendy has totally made us do is buy a dog. Um, and Petra and Wendy have conspired and we've got this beautiful dog looking at us, looking, looking, she's looking all night. What is she thinking? And this is us with a gift that Carl Madigan gave me and I'll give it back to the National Gallery when they ask for it. Um, and their, their family. What, what I'm saying is family is utterly important. And where I want to end my life is with my wife and in rusing, ruminating around art. That's how I see my future. Now I've got a little thing that helps. It's three minutes. Oh, just be quiet for God's sake. They're all... No, okay, you want me to stop? I can no, stop, but no, 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 it's three no. minutes. I mean, for me, you came all the way for, what, 20 minutes? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you came all the way. Where did you come from? Bolivia or somewhere. Um, I, I think you, you came from somewhere civilised. It was Northern Europe. It was, you know, civilised recently. And so what we should do is go through this very quickly because it gives you a picture of what I hear when I go through our landscape. Can we do this? And it summarises everything. It's only three minutes. I'm sorry I went over, but everyone expected it from him. So. No one can do it. Maybe we don't do it. I have this woman called Savina Yanatsu, who I won't, we won't do it. Oh, do you want to do it? Well, 
I can't control the thing. The people in the back are not very good and I just can't control it. So it's a bit like my life. So that's how we learnt music. No instruments. Thank you. <laughs> Have we run out of time? I guess, I guess it's fine if we go for the roundtable discussion directly. Yes. Uh, so Richard, if you can join Richard, you them. Angelo and true Angelo fashion saw the rules and threw them aside. And well, I mean, you know, rules are there. Um, look, I think it's not about being broken. It's just, what, what's this chair? I'm too short for this chair. <laughs> what did you think I was going to be? So, obviously, there's questions I can answer. I really think that it would be much nicer to hear questions from the board. So, um, does anybody have any that they're going to start with? I know it always takes some. Oh, someone who's going to bring it to you. Sorry, they're coming. Oh. Or you can speak loud. I think just the, inter the people online can't hear it. Oh, no problem. Yeah, just very interesting, Angelo, um, the, the story you told there. And something that I struggle with personally as an architect is just the balance between work and life. And it was very interesting, your, um, your consideration there where your wife and family were so important in your life. And I'm just wondering if that was a, is that, that's a recent reflection or... How have you found the balance between achieving such great architecture and your family? One day, um, someone said, Louis Kahn said to them, that his work was the work that connected him to his soul and a greater power. And so it was actually the work of his life. 
and it's not what you think. It's everything. So your work is your children, your work is your family, your work is what you draw, what you think. And just like we say we want very much to just have no boundaries in architecture and bring everything to coalesce together, how can we then not do that in our lives? So the question presupposes that one goes to work at nine, finishes at five, sends a bill at the end of the month, and that's the end of it. And then what's your life about, actually? It's kind of one-dimensional. So yeah, Mary works in uh, every single person that is a dear friend I'm working with. I've tried very hard, and we're working together with Richard now. Every single person that is a dear friend I'm working with. And that's the aim. Mm. How else will you meet them more? I love it. Mm. I want them in my life. And I hope they want me in theirs. There was another hand down the front. Hi, good evening. Architecture is a pretty serious business, and so we have to be earnest. But I think sometimes in a safe place, we can also stray into being romantic. And I think, you know, we've seen some of that tonight. But amongst friends, sometimes we can really let our guard down. And I suppose, I know you both have a great sense of humour. And my question is, could you both share a professional story of failure or really when the joke was perhaps a little on you? Richard, do you want to start? There's so many, it's hard to pick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so, many, there's so many occasions, I think, when somebody mentions something and you think you know or understand it and you open your mouth only to prove that you know nothing. Um, and I can't think of a specific instance, but I've learned... I've learnt to not say anything until I understand um, what it is I need to say. Um, but I've put my foot in it too many times. Well, I can share today what I did to put my foot in it, and then I can share yesterday and then the day before. Just three. Today I sat in front of a client and I, th I said to them, I think you're stupid. And then I thought, did I say that out loud? And then I had to kind of retract a bit. And then I thought, no, actually, you are stupid. This is a stupid idea. We're not doing this. And he said, I've never been called stupid in my life. And I thought, oh, I know, that's why you are behaving this way. But I didn't say that. Um, so all I could think of is, oh, my God, I'm kind of going to lose him as a client. Oh, thank, thank God, I don't care, you know, that sort of thing. Um, yesterday, I was with Phil, and we were in um, the, the gallery, and the meeting finished half an hour beforehand, and I just kept on talking like an idiot, you know, and Phil said, you've got to stop talking, we're going to get in trouble, because I just kept on volunteering things, and just in my enthusiasm, it was so stupid. Um, the, the day before, I probably made someone cry in the office, and I didn't really want to make them cry, I just said something, you know, in a kind of parametric way, and then I looked up, and they were crying, and I thought, oh, okay... And then the day before, I said to my mother, my mother said, oh, Angelo, your auntie, your auntie, she fell at Easter. You have to call. And I said, but she, did she want me to call? I said, she said, no. I said, I'll call. She said, actually, don't call. So, Thea, Thea, you fell at Easter. I told your mother <laughs> to not call. And so I had half an hour on the phone. She said, I only fractured eight parts of my hand and I was waiting for people at dinner and then there was new people we were interviewing. So, yeah, if you really want to know, um, there isn't a day that goes past without a minor incident. Um, the really big ones are when you, um, when you lose a job because you say something honest. And they're the really big good moments of your life too because you say you lose a job because you say something honest. Mm. Um, so life can be both a comedy and a tragedy, but you have to keep to your standards and values and it irons it all out. Otherwise, all you're doing is trying to impress the person that's in front of you. And really that's not very good, actually. That's not a very good outcome in your life. It might be trouble for that moment. Any other questions? 
They don't dare. Did you have a question? <laughs> Look, I mean, I did, but I feel like um, <laughs> nobody really needs to hear from me. Um, I think what's been really wonderful tonight is that I'm a big believer that our lives, all of our lives, colour the kind of architecture that we create. And I think it's been really incredible to see two um, very good friends talk in such different ways about how their life you know, uh, impacts on their work. And I wonder if, um, if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to actually work together as friends, you know, because I imagine we're all quite different. And if, if that's a challenge or if that's a real joy to work together as friends. I think the attraction of being different is really important. If, if we, we hold similar values, but we're totally different. And, and that's stimulating. It also opens up possibilities that we haven't thought about ourselves, about issues. Um, I think what's really nice is that the longer the friendship goes, the more we can talk in shorthand, the more we can broach complex subjects or comments with, with a, a movement of the eye or hand, and we understand entirely what we're talking about, but others don't get it. And so there's a joy, and that comes, that's, that comes from knowing and respecting each other over a long period of time. And that's a great, that's a great joy. It doesn't happen too often, but when it does, it's very, very wonderful. It's very special. Well, can I explain it as well? We had a thing where, um, uh, we were doing this competition for the National Gallery of Victoria and I wanted very much to work with Richard um, but I, 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 I wanted to do my own work um, and there's this constant um, tension between seeking a collaboration and also getting a singularity in the work. There's nothing worse than this kind of rudder of ship that some companies have where everyone has a say and they do this kind of board discussion and everyone sort of nods and says smart things and it's all empirical and there's absolutely no um, emotion. I find that utterly depressing. Um, but for me, um, when I asked Richard, can he mentor this project? He said, Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we were on, let me say, okay, wind forward to um, uh, email, Richard, I've sent you a current plan of the typical gallery level. And I press send and my phone is ringing. <laughs> and he said, you have to stop what you're doing. <laughs> this is a mess. And I said, what's so wrong with it? It's so beautiful. It has triangle lifts and it has octagonal you know, stairs and it has all this stuff about Euclid. And he said, none of it works. It's a joke. And so I thought, oh my God. All I was doing was kind of just doing Braque paintings. And actually architecture is about things functioning. And at a certain level, um, and we were in a Zoom meeting once as well, and this is very funny, because everyone in my team is Zoom meetings because we're all sort of Zooming along because everyone didn't want to get COVID. And um, there was Richard, and he did this. I'll show you what he did. He went. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, thank you, Richard. No conversation. Everyone said, but you didn't say anything. No, 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 no. There's no need to explain. I don't want you to explain it. And someone in my office said, I do. And I said, oh, my God, this is going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> you know? And he said, well, I don't think you should be doing this. This is just my personal advice. I think you should be doing this, 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 and this. And I said, well, I said to Richard, I didn't want you to say that because it would make me feel stupid in front of all of my staff. And thank you. But yeah, it was all wrong. And Richard helped a lot. But what we did is that's a Friday afternoon. And we'd come back on the Monday. And Richard would say to us in the Zoom meeting on the Monday after we'd worked all through the weekend, all through periods of work and not work and rest, he'd say, that's great. And he wouldn't need to say any more. And I'd say, 
and I wouldn't need to say any more. And I've loved that. I think it's a privilege to work. We're working with Glenn. I'm working with Wendy. I'm working... Beetroot sandwiches. <laughs> Glenn refers to some of my work as beetroot sandwiches. He saw a plan of mine that was it had a red piazza in the centre for a competition and he said, oh my God, it looks like a beetroot sandwich. I just, I just changed the whole thing on the weekend. And he said, oh, you've changed it all. I said, you called it a beetroot sandwich. Um, what I have to say about that is I totally respect their opinion because it doesn't come from a bad place. It doesn't come from egos. It doesn't come from them trying to prove themselves. It doesn't come from someone younger that is kind of desperate to get their idea out. It comes from love. And not to me, to the work, that we leave something behind that actually is a legacy. And they have entrusted in me certain things, and I totally respect that. And I will deliver good work. I will deliver good work. And it's me in the end, because the office comes and goes. It's me. And then the next person comes. And there has to be a general. There has to be a composer. You can have a lot of people composing in some offices, and that can work in those offices. But it doesn't work in mine. It's very simple. All right. Well, I think we might need to leave it there for the timing. Um, shall okay. we invite them in back? Are you flying back? Are you what, catching a <laughs> flight? <laughs> <laughs> no. It came and went. So busy. Actually, so busy. You missed the flight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, yeah, we're a bit over the time. It was a um, uh, huge honor to have you both uh, on the stage. Uh, we're very thankful for your participation. Um, also thankful, thankful for uh, the moderation of Shannon. Thank you a lot. Um, I failed in that task. <laughs> no, we, are, we are going to um, uh, going to have some food now and some drinks. Uh, but remember that. Uh, before you go home, take the bags that you see there, where you will find a gift from each of our partners, um, the, the Brickworks, Agufeld, and the CCAA. So you will find it there. Don't forget to take the, the bags. We are very thankful for, for this evening, and we are looking forward to, to these uh, conversations. The online participants, we will, you will miss it, I'm sorry. And um, yeah, thank you a lot for being here, for being part of it, and don't forget the bags. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to give you a hug. <laughs>